One early morning, Catherine Knight decided to surprise her stepchildren with a home-cooked meal after they have gotten home from school. Serving up meat with baked potato, carrot, pumpkin, beetroot, zucchini, cabbage, yellow squash, and gravy in two settings at the dinner table, along with notes beside each plate, each having the name of the children on it. But luckily for the children, the cops had gotten there before the kids made it home from school, and what the cops discovered was shocking and disturbing. Born on October 24, 1955, in Tenterfield, Australia, Catherine Mary Knight was the product of a scandalous affair between her mother, Barbara Roffin, and her father, Ken Knight. Barbara was not only already a mother of four boys with another man, but she met Ken Knight through her husband. When their secret rendezvous came to light, it rocked their small conservative town. Following this tumultuous start, Catherine's chaotic childhood didn't get much better from there. Her father was a violent alcoholic who raped her mother multiple times a day. Catherine herself claims that she was sexually assaulted by several family members until the age of 11. In school, Catherine was known as a bully who terrorized smaller children. Without ever learning how to read or write, she quit at the age of 15 to work at a clothing factory. A year later, she landed her dream job at a slaughterhouse cutting out the internal organs of animals. Journalist Peter Lalore wrote in Bloodstain, his true crime book that covered Catherine Knight, that she loved her job so much that she hung her first set of butcher's knives over her bed, just in case she ever wanted to use them. While working in the butcher shop, Catherine met David Kellett, a raging alcoholic much like her father who was prone to fistfights. Used to this kind of violence, Catherine surprised her new lover when she joined in on one of his drunken scuffles. He soon realized, however, that Catherine was capable of doing more than a little damage with her fists. Before long, he found himself being dominated by her. In 1974, she convinced him to marry her. He was heavily intoxicated the entire time, and her mother even warned him about her daughter's temper, telling him to watch out. You better watch this one or she'll fucking kill you. There's a screw loose somewhere. On their wedding night, Catherine and Kellett consummated their marriage three times. When he fell asleep, Catherine wanted a fourth round and took issue with her new husband's exhaustion, so she started to strangle him. Kellett woke up and managed to fight Catherine off. Even though she attempted to kill him only one day into their marriage, the union lasted for ten more years. The marriage was, however, far from perfect. Kellett was often unfaithful, and once even left his wife and their two daughters in the middle of the night. After discovering one of Kellett's affairs, Catherine placed their two-month-old infant on the local train tracks shortly before a train was due. The train didn't come and the infant was spared, and also threatened several people with a stolen axe. She was also diagnosed with postnatal depression after witnesses saw her violently pushing and swinging her second child in a stroller down a busy street. She spent a few months in a psychiatric hospital where she told nurses that she intended to kill a mechanic who had fixed Kellett's car because that made it possible for him to leave her. Despite this threat, Kellett took Catherine back when she was released from the hospital. Their reunion didn't last long, and Catherine went through a period of deep distress after Kellett finally did leave her. And Catherine would have other relationships that would end in tragedy. David Saunders, 38-year-old miner, moved in with her and her daughters, although he kept his old apartment in Scone. Catherine soon became jealous regarding what he did when she was not around and would often throw him out. He would move back to his apartment, where she would invariably follow and beg him to return. In May 1987, she cut the throat of his two-month-old dingo pup in front of him, for no more reason than as an example of what would happen if he ever had an affair before going on to knock him unconscious with a frying pan. Still, they stayed together and even had a daughter a year later. However, Saunders left Catherine shortly after the birth because she had attempted to kill him with a pair of scissors. And then she met John Chillingworth. In 1991, 
Catherine became pregnant by the 43-year-old former abattoir co-worker and gave birth the following year to a boy they named Eric. Their relationship lasted three years before she left him for a man she had been having an affair with for some time, a man named John Charles Thomas Price. John Charles Thomas Price was the father of three children when Catherine began an affair with him. Reputedly, he was liked by everyone who knew him. His own marriage had ended in 1988. While his two-year-old daughter had remained with his former wife, the two older children lived with him. John was well aware of Catherine's violent reputation as she moved into his house in 1995. His children liked her. He was making a lot of money working in the local mines, and apart from violent arguments, at first, life was going great. In 1998, Catherine and John fought over his refusal to marry her. In retaliation, she videotaped items he had allegedly stolen from work and sent the tape to his boss. Although the items were out-of-date medical kits that he had scavenged from the company Rubbish Tip, John was fired from the job he had held for 17 years. That same day, he kicked her out, and she returned to her own home while news of what she had done spread throughout the town. A few months later, John restarted the relationship, although he now refused to allow her to move in with him. The fighting became even more frequent, and most of his friends would no longer have anything to do with him while they remained together. In February 2000, a series of assaults on John culminated with Catherine stabbing him in the chest. Finally fed up, he kicked her out of his house. On the 28th of February, he stopped at the Scone Magistrate's court on his way to work and took out a restraining order in an attempt to keep her away from both him and his children. That afternoon, John told his co-workers that if he did not come to work the next day, it would be because Catherine had murdered him. Despite their pleas that John should not return home, he stated that he was afraid Catherine would kill his children if he did not. John arrived home to find that Catherine, although not there herself, had sent the children away for a sleepover at a friend's house. He then spent the evening with his neighbors before returning home and going to bed at 11 p.m. Earlier that day, Catherine had bought new black lingerie and had videotaped all her children while making comments which have since been interpreted as a crude will. She later arrived at John's house while he was sleeping and sat watching television for a few minutes before having a shower. She then woke John and they had sex, after which he fell asleep. At 6 a.m. the next day, a neighbor became concerned that John's car was still in the driveway, and when he did not arrive at work, his employer sent a worker to see what was wrong. Both the neighbor and the worker tried knocking on John's bedroom window to wake him, but they alerted police after noticing blood on the front door. Breaking down the back door, police found something that was absolutely horrifying. That night when she arrived at John's house while he was sleeping, and then woke Price to have sex. Then, Catherine Knight took a butcher knife from next to her bed, where she had always kept them, and stabbed John 37 times. He woke up during the attack and tried to fight her off. He attempted to escape while Catherine chased him through the house. The pain must have been unbearable, and with his lungs now so badly damaged, he couldn't shout for help. He managed to open the front door and almost made it outside but he stumbled backwards due to his injuries leaving a bloody handprint on the doorframe and then was dragged back into the hallway where she continued to stab him relentlessly. He finally died after bleeding out. But that's not all she did. She decided to use her butchering skills on John. The police officers had decades of experience between them, but nothing could have prepared them for what they were about to witness. They entered the premises with their weapons drawn there was blood everywhere and a large pool of blood near the entrance foyer. Then what was thought to be a blanket hanging in a doorway arch leading into the lounge turned out to be, on closer inspection, John Price's exterior layer of skin hanging from a meat hook. Oh my God, she skinned him! One of the officers gasped. It was removed in one piece. Moving further into the house, they caught the smell of something that had been cooking coming from the kitchen. Further extreme horrors were to be revealed. There was a large boiler pot, still warm, on the stove. On opening the lid, they saw John Price's skinned head, 
along with a quantity of vegetables. After Catherine had decapitated him, she'd cooked parts of his body, serving up the meat with a variety of vegetables, including baked potatoes and gravy, in three settings at the dinner table. She'd also prepared notes alongside the plates, each one having the name of one of his children written on it. She then made a dish for herself, though the half-discarded contents later found at the crime scene in the backyard suggest that she couldn't finish her meal. Later identified to be John Price's left buttock, they found the victim's decapitated remains on the lounge room floor near a small foyer leading to the front door. The body was raw and bloodless. Given the injuries and blood loss, that was hardly surprising. The left arm of John Price's body was draped over an empty 1.25 liter soft drink bottle and his legs were crossed. Then they heard a loud snoring sound coming from the main bedroom and looked through the door. The light switch was bloodstained and there was the body of Catherine Knight. She had taken a large number of pills and passed out in a failed attempt to overdose. Despite her claims that she had no recollection of the night John Charles Thomas Price died, Catherine Knight was quickly charged with his murder. In October of 2001, her trial commenced, but it didn't get very far. For reasons that remain unclear, Catherine changed her plea to guilty and the judge adjourned the case without testimony. She was escorted to prison that day and the judge ordered that her papers be marked never to be released. For the first time in history, a woman in Australia was given a life sentence without parole. To this day, Catherine nevertheless maintains her innocence and refuses to accept responsibility for her actions. Catherine Knight has appealed her sentence before and was denied almost immediately. She is still serving her life sentence at Silverwater Women's Correctional Center.